My background is quite mixed. Uh, so I was born and raised in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, where I was really interested in mathematics. So I, uh, that was what I was exploring. And I ended up at Harvard College where I majored in mathematics. But at the same time, I was also really interested in questions related to inequality and discrimination in the city of Cambridge where I was living and studying as a college student. It's interesting to look back now, but sort of the writing was on the wall because I was thinking about how algorithms that are being used to assign students to public schools were creating and exasperating inequality that exists and how those same algorithms could actually be used to mitigate some of those inequalities. I realized that actually I could explore both my interest in mathematics and my interest in questions around inequality and discrimination at the same time as a computer scientist. So that's how sort of I landed from my background in math to what I do now. My work is really focused on questions around inequality and discrimination. What I usually do is I, you know, I have a couple of domains that I'm really interested in. So economic welfare, housing, um, education are domains where I'm, I've been uh, pretty deeply embedded. I think about ways in which discrimination plays out in these domains. Uh, ways in which we're not maybe doing a very good job measuring the inequality or the sort of disadvantage that people are facing. And then after doing that, I also think about what can be done about this, right? What can be done to measure it? So one example that I'll give you is um, we've been thinking a lot about uh, different income shocks that people experience, right? So these income shocks could be something as large as, let's say, uh, you know, you, you get sick and now you have this major medical expense or it could be something small like, you know, your paycheck was delayed by a week or maybe you got a parking ticket, right? And so these different types of shocks have differential impact on people. So some people may not necessarily even notice if their paycheck was delayed by a week, right? But other people, that could be the reason why they end up getting evicted. And so what we've been doing is both modeling that and thinking about how we can allocate different types of resources and subsidies uh, and different poverty alleviation programs to address not just sort of these uh, straightforward ways of measuring uh, poverty or, or, or disadvantage, but also these more subtle ways that, uh, that we know to be important. We've also been working with some data sets. Uh, for instance, we're seeing that a lot of male individuals uh, when they experience um, uh, something with the criminal justice system, let's say they are stopped by the police, they, uh, they're robbed, you know, there's something that they've experienced with the criminal justice system or crime in general, it seems like that, um, uh, that really deeply impacts experiences they have with poverty. Whereas for female individuals from this data set, when they have experiences with financial shocks, like they lose benefits, they have some major expense, things like that, that seems to have a much uh, deeper impact on female uh, if, uh, female respondents from the survey that we've been working with. So we've been doing both sort of the modeling and theoretical set of questions to extract qualitative insights about how we should be designing our poverty alleviation programs, but then also the computational work to learn from the ground up what are people experiencing. I think that the world would be a much better place if anyone cared more about not just social issues, but really specifically issues that are being faced by communities on the margins of society. I really think so, and certainly this is true of computer scientists as well. Right now in computer science, I think that we've made some progress, so I don't want to completely be negative about this, but, but there are some serious issues around, one, just representation of communities in the field. If people are not there to see what their problems are and ways in which they're being left behind, we're not really going to make progress. I think a lot of times we assume that we can just go and learn about other communities and we can kind of proxy represent them, and that's just at best a stopgap. Once you have people within that community, you need to actually make sure that they're empowered, that they're getting the resources that they need, that they feel heard, right? And that their contributions are valued in the same way as anyone else who's around. And that issue of sort of equity and inclusion, this is where we usually lose the battle, right? People get people through the door and then they say, okay, well, what more do you want? You know, we have people of this group here, isn't that enough? No, it's absolutely not enough. In fact, if you're doing it wrong, it's actually worse because now you've put in people in an environment where they're not gonna thrive, where they're not gonna succeed. We've been kind of stuck in this representation uh, 
uh, goal, right? Just let's get people through the door, just enough of them that we don't feel bad about it. And that's, and that's enough, and that's not enough, right? We really need to make sure that we're continuing to make progress. I did my dissertation defense back in November 2019, and this was 2019, and I was the first black woman at Com Cornell Computer Science to defend her thesis. I was the first black woman in its entire history, and you know, it was it was on, obviously an honor. It was something that was really exciting to me, but it was also a weight that I felt right because I was thinking about all the other black women who would have loved <laughs> to have done their degree at Cornell CS, and they weren't able to do that. And what was really heartwarming for me, but also kind of sad, was that at my defense, um, a bunch of undergraduate students showed up, a bunch of black undergraduate students showed up to, to watch my defense. I'd, I've never seen that before, and I, and I was just so through, I don't even know how they knew about it, but they showed up, they showed up en masse, and it was this really heartwarming thing for me to have them. And you know, when you do your defense, there's a bit that, you know, where the person who's defending goes out and then the committee stays in and they discuss, you know, uh, you know, do you pass or do you not pass, whatever. So I stepped out for the committee to discuss on their own and the undergrads were waiting for me. And, and it was just really heartwarming because not only were they waiting, they were crying because it was just so meaningful to them to see me. And it was just so meaningful to me. It really stuck with me because I would have loved to see that when I was an undergrad. I would have loved to see a defense by another black woman, right? And so I think that we need to think about not just, you know, what can we get out of like representation, right? Like, can we get the right people here so they can give us the right answers and they can make us look good, right? I feel like a lot of times that's like the tone that I get, but just like, what are we showing to our students that we're supposed to be serving? What are we showing to them about what we value in our community? And I think that's something that is incredibly important that's not talked about enough. So uh, Black and AI was um, started as a, it was really started as, actually as an email list and then a Facebook group. Really what was happening was there were several of us who knew each other or knew of one another and each of us were, you know, unsurprisingly the only black person at our institution, right? I was, you know, sort of the only black person at Cornell, you know, Timmy Gabru, my co-founder, was sort of one of few people at Stanford and so on, right? So each of us were sort of feeling isolated and we wanted to come together in a way that was not just an annual conference, right? We wanted to just sort of stay in touch with one another, exchange ideas and kind of support one another. But it very quickly grew, you know, it went from 30 people to 300 people in like the span of one month. And, you know, it's been three years or something and now we're at close to 4,000 people. What's happened is that people have used this critical mass that we have to identify patterns of exclusion that we're experiencing. So for instance, in Black and AI, I run the academic program, and what we've identified there is that there are a lot of people who want to pursue graduate school, and they can't because they can't afford to take the GRE. You know, they take the GRE, they can't retake it. They take the GRE, they don't have money to send scores to different institutions. Um, you know, there's just all sorts of different issues. It's not just the GRE. And so what we've been able to do is to systematically document and identify these barriers that individuals are facing and to identify ways that we can counter that. So one thing that's happened that I'm really excited about is uh, we ran this academic program for people applying to graduate programs um, and each year there's about 200 people who apply to graduate programs. We systematically documented barriers that they're facing and we took that and we gave it to universities and we said, listen, you, you have an institution that has no black people or maybe a handful of black people maybe, right? You're not even getting applications that you should be getting because there are all these barriers that you're not thinking about. We were able to kind of share these insights with institutions and really change how some institutions do things. So at Berkeley where I am, uh, we removed the GRE, we made adjustments to how we evaluate candidates. We made sure that we actually evaluated every candidate who is applying to graduate programs uh, by actually reading their applications and reading it in a way, I'm not gonna compare you to someone else who had access to more things. I'm gonna look at what you have access to and what you did with those opportunities. And from that, make a decision about, you know, whether I think you're gonna take full advantage of being at Berkeley versus not. And it made a huge difference. Our admitted class is over 15% uh, a block among those uh, working in AI, actually over 15% 15, 15 block. And, and these are some, some of the most incredible people you've ever met and doing some of the most innovative work that I've, that I've ever seen. 
uh, but work that could be totally missed if, if it's being evaluated by a group of homogenous, pe you know, homo homogenous community that doesn't necessarily understand the diversity of problems that are out there and sort of the, the diversity of ways in which you can show your strength as a researcher.